welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and we have a show today that uh, I think is just so key, uh, particularly with what's going on in Missouri uh, right now, Ninth Ward, New Orleans. Um, it's time to reflect. It's time to look at what's going on. Uh, of course, we continue on talking about mass incarceration, and we look at the term hyperincarceration. Uh, we have a guest for you today, uh, Dr. Alex Mikulish. He is a professor of uh, theology at Loyola University here in New Orleans, uh, bachelor's in history. Um, uh, and uh, he has co authored a book called The Scandal of White Complicity in the U.S. Hyper Incarceration, a Nonviolent Spirituality of White uh, Resistance. Welcome, uh, Dr. Mikulish. How are you today? Thank you so much. Did I pronounce it's it all right? I did pretty decent. Mikulich, that's, that's Mikulich. right. Mikulich, all right, there we go. Mikulich, all right, let's get it right. Mikulich, <laughs> that is, no, that's so, so important. It's great to be here with you. No, it, it, it is great. Um, really look forward to it. Uh, groundbreaking, uh, the book, the concept, um, from uh, your perspective, from a, say, white perspective, so to speak. Uh, uh, but let's deal, first, let's deal with some definitions. Uh, Hyper-incarceration, mass incarceration. Let's talk about that a little bit first. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm argue, I'm ar I am arguing in the book that um, what is really happening in the United States today is about uh, the disproportionate um, uh, arrests uh, and sentencing of black and Latino men. And mass, if, if we had a situation of mass incarceration, mm -hmm. then masses of all groups of people in the United States would be over incarcerated. Okay. But that's not what we have. What we have is a society that um, hyper incarcerates people of colors and specifically African Americans and Latinos um, and also white people. Um, so it's a it's a system that is is uh, a racist system um, and it's also a system that um, it's it's incarcerating, people who are um, also poor. Okay, so there's both a racial and economic dimension of it. Okay, Louisiana leads the list in the world. And the, the United States is is the leader in the world in, in uh, the number of people we incarcerate. We incarcerate, um, well we have more people in the criminal justice system today than there were slaves in 1850. Okay, um, that's a point that Michelle Alexander makes in in her book, um, um, and um, you know, and then here in Louisiana, um, we disproportionately we're, we're the leader in incarcerating um, African Americans. In the United States, okay. so we, so we're a leader in the world in a sense of of disproportionate arrests, sentencing, and incarceration. Okay, so the argument on the other side is uh, uh, black people commit crimes and need to go to jail. That's it. Why are we having an argument? Um. Well, I I, I think that we. Um, I would argue that we need to understand U.S. history to understand the, the roots of our system of incarceration. Um, to, to get directly to your point, um, if we're really about um, incarcerating, uh, say, people who are dealing drugs, well, what white people are dealing drugs um, as much, if not more, than African Americans, yet who is being arrested, who's being incarcerated? Um, that's number one in terms of, of looking at it today. Mm -hmm. But then um, to understand 
why are we so focused, why is society and why is the criminal justice system so focused on communities of color? We need to go back and look at the war on drugs, okay? And the war on drugs, um, I was mentioning Michelle Alexander, she, she explains in depth how the war on drugs had nothing to do with ending uh, drug running and it had nothing to do with capturing the kingpins but what it had everything to do with from the get-go was an attack on communities of color okay so um, I you know the language of criminalization is is fraught um, today with I, I think it is we have a racist system and we have to go back even further in history to understand I and mean, we have to go back to the founding of the nation we have to go back to slavery we have to go back to white pushback during Reconstruction, the creation of Jim Crow and lynching. Um, and I believe unless white people come to terms with that history, we will not understand um, you know, why it is that uh, Michael Brown is, is brutally murdered in Ferguson, Missouri, or Ezel Ford is brutally murdered in Los Angeles. Um, you know, we have to come to terms with our history and how we have been shaped, how we've been socialized into white superiority and also the criminalization of blackness. Um, you know, okay, so then uh, we, we were talking earlier about, I mean, the fact is that historically the whole human race is mixed. It's very complex in how we're, we are mixed. But we live in a society that is dominated by white European culture. And that white superiority is not only about um, the white supremacy of slavery, although it is rooted in that. Mm -hmm. It has a very different shape. It takes different forms today. And it's taken different forms through history. And that's what I try to, I try to go and trace the history of white supremacy and understand, try to begin to understand how it's linked to the um, criminalization of blackness. Well, uh, yeah, the two thirds, what, three fifths human, the two thirds human, three in the fifths. Con in the, the original um, constitution, the, in the three fifths, Clause, okay. That was that was an agreement between Southern representatives and the, the entire or the original um, Congress um, to count slaves as three fifths of a person, so that they that so. As a, as, as they were used as a means of power in who gets voted in to, to become a representative. So, and then, I, then also I think we even have to step back and look at the Declaration of Independence to understand the three-fifths clause. Because in the Declaration of Independence, when Jefferson writes, all men are created equal, he does not mean all human beings throughout the world. He means specifically white land-owning males. Okay, so um, we need to understand that there's a conflict within our democracy that goes to the very founding of the nation. And we have never come to terms with that. And when I say we, I'm, I'm saying we white people 
because through history, people of color have, have dealt with it and have, the, there, are, there are many people who have, uh, African Americans, um, d uh, different uh, first Americans, um, many people from uh, uh, different perspectives have critiqued the racism of the system. But whites have never come to terms with our role in reestablishing it throughout history. Okay, uh, I've, I've learned a lot. You know, with um, the advent of the uh, digitized newspaper, CNN and um, NOLA.com or whatever, for years you had the newspaper and you just read what the columnist wrote, period. That was it. But now with the, uh, the fact that it's digitized, um, you have comments from people all over the country or whatever, yes, you know, yes. particularly now, uh, you know, when I was coming up in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, you had the Ku Klux Klan and they had, you know, white hoods and nobody would talk about racist stuff, you know, particularly during the 70s. You just didn't have a whole lot of that, you know, people lose their job, you know, whatever, speaking about racism. But now in the comment section, any day you look, the comments actually are more dominant than the journalist story. So, you know, you pull up on a computer, you know, uh, what happened like in Missouri, you have 50 pages of comments and a little couple of paragraphs of a story. So the comments dominate. And the comments, the racism in the comments that black people are animals, I mean, they may use different, more flowery terms, but the idea that uh, black people are less on an evolutionary scale goes back again to Hitler and, you know, and, 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 and all the way around. Well, the argument when is that, now wait a minute, we will be wiped out by black people if we mix races. And if they're less on an evolutionary scale, um, so for them, they're honest. I'm like, wait, we, we want to maintain our existence. So we have to keep this separation. And they are more ignorant and more animalistic. We had a guy talking about that this morning. Uh, what's wrong with their fears of losing the white race? Well, um, you know, I'm, I, my background, my training is in theology. Okay. Racism is a lie. Okay, and it's a lie that... Um, is both about um, the the consequences of racism, like Michael Brown being murdered in the street, mm -hmm. um, but it's also about uh, how I, and not just I, but white people in the United States are enculturated into um, racism. And there are several things I want to say in, in response to what you brought up about um, di digital media. Um, and I mean, one thing is, first off, it's a lie because um, we know from genetic science that there's only one race, the human race, and actually. We've, all, we've also learned, all of us throughout the whole world, we're rooted in Africa. You know, and, and the, the, uh, the, the rock star Bono says to, Ameri to, to US Americans, well, maybe we're all African American? You know, we, we need to think about that, okay? And come to, we need to come to grips with the truth, okay? And then in terms of the digital, there's, there's been um, a good deal of research about how race is um, lived out in the backstage and the front stage. Okay, mm -hmm. so when whites are among whites in a comfortable white environment, they may say things that they won't say in public, in the, the front stage, okay? A problem that I have with the comments is that I think we should not have anonymous 
authors on the comments because anonymity contributes to people feeling the comfort of the backstage. I can be racist here because no one knows who I really am. Okay. Um, so I, 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 um, I can't give and I won't give any legitimacy to a fear based on scientific genetic racism. Okay. okay. Um, now, there's a different issue of um, fear that, and I think more complex and more difficult to deal with, of whites living in segregated communities where um, they, they really do not have any African American, Latino, Vietnamese friends. So they, so they don't know the everyday experience of people of color. Um, and when, um, in the book, what we, what I, I developed this in terms of a sociological term, it's called white habitus. And white habitus is about where and how we live. Okay, so it's not only that we have segregated ourselves into all white communities, but then we're also enculturated. We're, that's a primary engine for socializing whites into an all-white worldview. That it, that, in what I would, you know, getting to the, the the digital responses. The digital responses are out of. T not only might they be racist, like categorically scientific racism. But also, they're out of touch with reality of lived experience of people who they need, we need to learn from. To, to, to know them, to, to understand where they're coming from, and also to know and understand ourselves. And, th and this is something that we argue that, that I, don't, I don't think that whites have yet to understand is how we need. Okay, this is uh, Martin Luther King was saying this, that the great um, Catholic uh, monk uh, Thomas Merton was arguing this. Whites need to understand how we need African Americans. We need to, we need to understand the um, experiences of Native Americans who were were violently um, moved out of their lands, you know, on the Trail of Tears. We need to know that history to understand what's happening in Native communities in the country today. But if we don't know that, we remain ignorant. And our ignorance has been rooted in an assumption of white innocence. And I think that that, that innocence is a deadly, um, cancerous assumption that's a part of the lie that is racism. Well, okay. Uh, up until digitized media and the comments um, through, and it's not just NOLA.com, I won't pick on them because it's CNN and any other, I mean, it's all over the country. Uh, and, and so this, this idea of the average Joe being able to voice his thoughts anonymously. Uh, up until that point, I think we were all hoping uh, somewhat the Martin Luther King that we're kind of, we're moving, moving uh, closer together. And uh, so when we see the, the, the sheer volume of racism on these comments throughout the country, any newspaper you go to, um, you start wondering, 
you're, st you know, they always had abolitionists doing slavery, but they were a the minority, okay? You always had abolitionists. So you, you start really wondering, well, kind of where are we at? Uh, there are only any studies to say the percentage of white people who know the truth on racism and, and wouldn't mind having a black grandchild, a great grandchild, uh, where race mixing, mixing is not a problem. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. I just um, don't know. Yes. Um, sadly, the, 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 the more things change, the more things stay the same. We are a racist society, yeah. um, and that's that's what we're arguing in, in this book that white people need to take responsibility for our role in racism in America. Um, now, I have like in within the work that I've done in the Catholic Theological Society of America, the Society of Christian Ethics, um, in di different learned societies, um, we're making some progress. I've been a member of the P Pax Christi USA anti-racism team. Um, there are many groups like Pax Christi that have taken up um, the work of anti-racism, um, similar to what the People's Institute here in New Orleans, the People's Institute does um, anti-racism training. There are other groups like that. There's there's Crossroads in Chicago, which trained the People's Institute. Um, there are a number of um, Catholic congregations of religious sisters who have taken up the Crossroads anti-racism training. Um, and that's a training that, um, that looks at this history I'm talking about, but also um, pushes us to, to reflect on how we live daily and, and the things that we do daily that, um, that re instantiate, rebuild racism in, in society. So there are, there's a lot of groups that are doing it, right. that are they're working to do it. Right. Um, the Catholic Church, um, there are, um, from the Vatican, but also from the U.S. Catholic bishops going back to the 1960s, there are a number of very eloquent pastoral letters, um, but there's a disconnect between the rhetoric and practice. Yeah, I don't know if we want to go there. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, yeah. But that's something that yeah, we've I'm, been working uh, yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. It's a different story. We're, we're come, not that, but I want to go but I do from think, a different perspective. I do think that we're, to answer your question, we still have white supremacy. And okay. perhaps it's not in the form of, I mean, I'm not a member of the KKK. Okay. Obviously. But, I mean, you, I mean, you, but, that, that's right, right. Um, the, the issue. We right. still have. And this is why we talk about complicity in this book. Complicity has to do with good white people Silent. participating in white supremacy. Okay, and there's there's the rub. That's the hard part. Let me jump in real quick. The libertarian standpoint would say. Uh, uh, let people be free to believe what they want to be. There's associated theologies that say that um, evil will be present and will be the majority in the world. So therefore, uh, you know, Martin Luther King's standpoint, I believe one day and da 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 and da da da, you know, white people and black people. Uh, as in the, in, in many, theologically we say that's an event that's gonna happen after, you know, Jesus comes back, whatever standpoint people want to look at it, that that's not going to happen. So let's recognize reality that you're going to have evil, uh, not ignorant people, because I don't think it's education. I think it's, it's evil and uh, evil people. So to expect that we'll ever wipe it out, 
you know, it's a dream. Again, that's what he said. I have a dream. No, that dream won't happen. So creating a society that recognizes evil existing but still protecting the weak through strength. Um, so your and so your question right the there. The question is directly going, is the idea of by shooting for a utopia that can't happen, are we missing the reality of building you know where we won't have these Missouri incidences and the hyper incarceration? Just approaching it from the reality. Hey, look, folk, this is what they're going to believe. They think black folk are baboons. Hey, no matter how many, let's start creating a structure that would have justice in, in, in truth without trying to change people's viewpoint. Okay, except that, except that um, we, I say we, white Americans tend to be Christian. It's overwhelmingly a Christian nation. And they claim to be Christian, okay? If we claim to be Christian, that involves particular commitments it's it's not whatever you want it to be. It means a commitment, an understanding. Um, what Jesus witnessed to is a God who loves everybody. Um, everybody is made in the image and likeness of God, and that createdness in God's love is the theological basis of equality. That's what King's whole, that's his entire witness and commitment is rooted in that. And then, and then in witnessing to, and trying to reenact within his day, um, you know, reinterpreting Jesus nonviolence. So, actually, um, Christianity is all about conversion. the The beginning of the Gospels are about John the Baptist. That baptism is the beginning of Christianity. It's it's an entrance into conversion, acknowledging my need not only for God, but my need for you, okay? So that means then living that out, okay? And, um, and I, but I also agree, yeah, okay. Health issues, <laughs> it's on, Ooh. do what you gotta do, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much.